So here's what we're going to do now. All right, first of all, uh, where's Jennifer? Jennifer, you got your little microphone? Now, we were originally going to have you write your questions and pass them down the road, but there's nothing to write on in terms of a little border thing. So any questions for the panel or anybody up here right now in terms of questions that have come up? Uh, yes. Could the panel discuss their, uh, their selection criteria for using multifocals after refractive surgery in view of the new data that we have? I know years ago we was something we didn't do, and lately we've been uh, expanding that, and not just on the extended depth of focus, but on true diffractive IOLs. Okay, now, sure. What do you, I, I, do so you to repeat the question was using the data in helping us select multifocal IOLs in, in a post-refractive surgery patient. So I'll just hit my point first. On my OPIC LASIK patients, if I look at that EKR spread on the EKR printout, where I see a nice focal ablation and nice regularity and not a big spread in my Ks, I found those patients can do very well with multifocal lenses and extended depth of focus lenses as long as the higher order aberrations are low. Hyperopic LASIK, you're going to find, I think, that the RMS era is typically higher than in a myopic treatment. And in a post RKI, I just have found these eyes are extremely difficult to manage with anything. Right, and it's a good point. So if you think about your hyperopic LASIK, I mean, you're making the cornea steeper, so you're going to have more depth of field with a regular with a monofocal IOL. So in those cases, I'm le I usually do not perform place a multifocal or a symphony IOL or EDF lens because the the cornea is already giving you more depth of field with a monofocal lens, and they're going to be really happy and have more range of vision. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to present that case next, and uh, so we'll, we'll kind of dissect it and, and, and get into it a little bit deeper. But I agree with the other comments, and for me, it's really a, a, a qualitative decision in terms of the symmetry of, by definition, what's irregular astigmatism. Uh, you can still have relatively symmetric irregular astigmatism in a post-refractive patient, and now with uh, EDOF lenses, we're much more comfortable using these in these cases where previously it had to be very, very, very select cases, but typically it's reserved for post-myopic and or post-RK uh, eight cut or less as long as it's a symmetric, uh, a symmetri a radially symmetric um, um, uh, topography. And yes. the other point is, is if your EKR65 on these patients is showing over a diopter of residual corneal sill in a post-refractive eye, I pretty much know that I'm going to shoot for compound myopic astigmatism so that I can come back and treat that astigmatism with a PRK on top of the LASIK flap. I've had very poor results with torque lenses, even with intraoperative aberrometry, because you can get them 2030, but 2030 is not 20 happy in today's market with that. You basically are, these patients want Plano. The only way to get them Plano seems to be the laser, really. Okay, so a couple of points to summarize. The value, the RMS HOA wavefront error, you're not usually using. How many have ever heard of that before? Right, you very few of you, and and here's there are studies out there. The one that that comes from primarily is one from a guy named McMillan in ophthalmology a few years ago, but basically what it showed was is patients had 1.4 microns of higher order aberrations over a six millimeter zone of the cornea, a hundred percent of them complained of halos and glare. All right. What that means is, if you add the reduced contrast from a multifocal lens of 30% lower contrast and a halo on top of the one they're already complaining of, your chance of failure and complaints from that patient are extremely high. Now, I will tell you though that there's another factor, and that is the patient's, uh, what I call their happiness factor. If you have somebody that just comes in and says, gee, Dr. Holliday, everything's wonderful. I don't care if I have halos. I just want to get the cataract out of there and I'll be happy with anything. Well, it's okay. You can put a multifocal and let them see up close, but most people aren't like that. The guys that many of you see is the physicist from the Hubble spacecraft that came back and wants 2019 vision. And I'm saying that in that guy, if he has more than one micron, of RMS HOA over a six millimeter zone, 
He's already complaining about a halo if he doesn't tell you about it. So that value. Now the other things that you hear about have to do with those semi-meridian broken. If those are broken, using a toric lens is exactly what Jim said. You cannot hit that on the button, and even if you go back and torque it around based on a post-LASIK calculator that lets you go back, it still never comes out perfect because their axes of astigmatism are not orthogonal, and they're not regular. So there may be an optimal, but they don't come out right. And you're better coming back with a laser that comes back and can actually treat some of the higher order aberrations. So it's much more precise. Today, the talk that I'm giving at three o'clock tomorrow, no, three o'clock this afternoon, today's Saturday, um, is just on that topic. 92% of our cases are within plus or minus a half a doctor with LASIK and PRK. 75% of our cases are within plus or minus a half a diopter with IOL calculations. A 20% difference. And the reason for that is that with the refractions, the only factor that comes into play with our refractive surgery, and when it comes into cataract surgery, we've got axial length, predicted ELP, K readings, pupil size, all kinds of factors which makes that 76%. So the point is that that refractive surgery is gonna get you closer today. Now there's some things we'll talk about that may get that better, but they're not gonna be doing it the way we are today. All right, so any other questions from the audience before we move on to George's second case presentation? Okay, George, I'm not gonna introduce you again. I'm just gonna let you do your second case. So let's see, is... Uh Okay, our next case is another post-refractive uh, case, and this is, um, but we're gonna flip the switch a little bit and talk about, instead of post-myopic, we're gonna talk about post-hyperopic LASIK and how we approach these cases. So here's a 69-year-old female who had hyperopic LASIK over a de decade ago. Of course, she also wants to uh, not need glasses afterwards. Um, and she's right eye dominant. Okay, so I'm actually gonna just, I'm just gonna present her non-dominant eye, which we started with in this case, which is, um, uh, 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 here we go, here's her right eye. So, first things first, um, let me just pull the panel. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Chatler. Um, how do you interpret this, and what are you thinking in terms of IOL selection? <clears throat> Well, so I typically would look at the sagittal view, um, which is the upper left screen, and you can see there's an area of red. Um, so it's, it's somewhat steep. I mean, this, the case is in the 46, so I'm thinking that this patient uh, will do best with a monofocal, neutral, spheric um, IOL, just because he's probably gonna have, this patient will probably get more depth of field because there's that steep central area. Yep. And <clears throat> gentlemen, do you have any additional comments here? So yeah. let's look at this a little bit here. Um, first off, what we've got is a, a relatively uh, steep cornea like Dr. Trattler just pointed out. And, and so this is a, um, a hyperprolate cornea, all right? And when we think about hyperprolate corneas, we want to think about a, a highly uh, um, negatively aspheric op uh, optical surface which Dr. Uh, Carolini Rocha taught us that increases depth of focus alone. And so we can actually utilize this to our advantage, and that's one of the really neat things when you have an opportunity to, to turn something that's actually a problem into something good, that's a good thing. And how are we gonna do that here? Well, we're gonna look at some of the information that Jack has uh, put, it, put into a single panel for us. We can look at the total negative spherical aberration, it's minus 0.65. So that's a lot of negative spherical aberration. Um, we look at the Q value, and then we can go on and also estimate the pre-refractive Ks like we talked about. It looks like it was a three diopter hyperopic uh, um, uh, ablation. And then we can look at the cord mu. And just a quick word about cord mu. We, uh, uh, we published this, I published this paper in the American Journal of Ophthalmology about three years ago with my good friend Daniel Chang and proposed this term cord mu based on some work that Jack and I had worked on for years in other projects um, talking about cords instead of angles. But I just went down the Greek alphabet to the next letter, which was mu. And the idea was just to redefine the way we're thinking about optical axes so it's clinically relevant. 
All right, and um, you know, and, and Oculus was good enough to to start adopting this technology. So is the IOL Master 700. And so we look at that when we think about centration of, of IOLs, particularly uh, with diffractive uh, um, IOLs. Now, when we look at trying to get a sense of what the, the, the true Ks are here, remember, this includes the anterior and the posterior K, we're starting to get a sense. This is about 40, a 46 diopter cornea, again, steep, and we know that it's hyperprolate. So uh, Dr. Trattler, we completely agree with how you would approach this. And this, we, we're going to utilize a concept called pseudo-accommodation. We actually um, have a large series of these. We've mapped out three or four different lenses and strategies and looked at the idea of pseudo-accommodation uh, and actually have done ray tracing and can show the pseudo-accommodation is a real thing with the, these types of strategies. So we're going to utilize a negative corneal, corneal sphere collaboration of minus 0, 0.65 diopters, and we want to actually preserve it and put it to use with an aberration-free IOL. We have a, only a few to choose from, and the one that we use regularly is the Bausch & Lomb uh, MX60, now the MX60E. Now, here I'm gonna do something a little bit unique. Um, when we target no defocus and just utilize the spherical aberration, we usually end up with a pretty good result, meaning not uncommonly we end up with excellent distance vision and some very useful reading vision. But this lady was adamant about wanting to be able to read. So what I did was I slightly offset the defocus, and, and if you go back and look at some of Dan Reinstein's work looking at pseudo-accommodation with the corneal plane, he's also adding some mini defocus in addition to iatrogenically inducing negative spherical collaboration on the cornea to find his sweet spot. So it's sort of a play off that, but using two lenses instead of one. And um, here is where it gets fun. It was a minus 19 and a half diopter predicted by the ASRS calculator with no prior refractive history. Again, um, we have this information um, also in the AXL. They predict a, a 20 diopter lens. But when we take the information of the estimated pre-op Ks, plug it into our double K formulas, we get a accordance, we get a 20 diopter uh, um, prediction for a 20 diopter lens. And again, it's right on the money with the, with the aura it confirms exactly what the double K showed with these pre-op estimated Ks. It's amazing. And, but what did I want to do? I wanted to fudge a little bit. It's where the art of medicine comes in. I wanted to make sure this patient could read. Um, and then we just added a little more myopic defocus. And this, end, this patient ended up actually doing quite well. I, I wish I had a 20.25 lens in this case, because that's exactly where I wanted to end up. And I probably ended up a little bit on the near side of things. So this patient ended up with a J2 2025-ish result. Very, very happy, but again, with a monofocal lens. And so that's where we want to think about the power of this software allows us to bring this under very tight control and predictability. Do we have any additional comments? So, George, for the here? audience, which lenses are you not going to want to use in this patient? Uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, we don't want to use a negative sphere collaboration lens in this in these patients, and and we would not. We personally would not use an EDOF lens, which is happens to be on the highest negative sphere collaboration profile, so it's a double whammy. When you look at the RMS predicted, um, it was in the one standard deviation outside of normal, that's yellow. If it's red, it's two standard deviations out of normal. So you've got that hit, plus we've got the negative sphere collaboration being compounded. Now you're at a di uh, I mean one, uh, 1 1.0 RMS of negative sphere collaboration, which has extraordinarily poor image quality. Yep. Okay, Pivo, yeah. Bill, it's your, uh, I might point out one thing uh, in terms of that pseudo accommodation. Come on up here, Bill, and you're on deck. And that is, remember uh, that there's one thing that when you look up close, you get a constriction of the pupil. And with negative spherical aberration, you have more power in the center of the zone than you do in the periphery. It's just the opposite of positive spherical aberration, where people get uh, basically uh, a decrease in power as their pupil constricts. So after myopic LASIK, you end up seeing a sacrifice in some of the near vision because it comes down to that flat spot in the middle of the cornea that has less power. Whereas with a hyperopic LASIK, or like you said, with minus 0.6, 
you end up with more power in the center. So when the pupil comes down, you actually see an increase in the power of the cornea and you end up with greater ad or better near vision. And the only thing you have to realize though is at night, when your pupil gets up to about uh, four and a half, five millimeters when you're in the cataract age group, no spherical aberration, positive or negative, gives you the best image at distance. No question, you don't want any aberration. And if you have over about four tenths to five tenths, both positive or negative, it equally decreases your distance vision and you end up with a little problem with uh, halos at night. So the upper limit is just about six tenths of a micron in terms of the amount of negative spherical aberration that you never want to exceed. And that's why using that spherical uh, aberration lens that's zero is the best because any negative, in fact, uh, you might even consider a spherical lens with a little positive spherical aberration to bring that back down to 0.5. But your choice of that was, I think, exactly what you needed. But the upper limit's 0.6. Bill. No, great comments. And um, I, I think one other thing is interesting is if there's a way to easily measure the pupil size at near preoperatively, that can also help predict. So we did have a technology where we were able to measure and we did find more pseudo accommodation in the, in the patient that could actually, actually had a very small pupil when looking at near with just regular cornea. So um, it's not an easy test, uh, but just something else to consider down the road. Okay, so this is actually somewhat of a similar case, but yet yeah, different. Uh, I love following in George's footsteps. So this is a patient that has very steep cornea and bilateral, cat cat uh, bilateral cataracts. And this is um, the Penicam. And so I guess my first question, do you guys think this is a keratoconus patient or something else? Are you uh, trying to hurt my feelings? Look at that. It's not even a regular color map. It's going up to that crazy purple. That's why we standardize those colors to go from blue to red so you can tell. I mean, all I can tell from Bill's that is I'm a sensitive I'm, guy. Yeah. I'm going colorblind is all I can tell you from that. I had to try to make it difficult. So uh, absolutely. So thank you for pointing that out. So we'll go to the more uh, accurate color map here. Um, and again, I, I've learned a lot from working, just preparing for, the, for this presentation and uh, working with the holiday maps. And you can say this is the patient um, that we saw, and this is actually um, a patient that had previous hyperopic LASIK, and I'm gonna show you the difference between this and keratoconus, uh, and this map really shows it very nicely. So, um, I kind of blew them up to make it a little bit easier for especially the people in the back to see, but you have the axial uh, map first, and you can see this, this is central steepening area. This is what we typically see in both a placido disc map, you know, you know the sagittal view um, is the one we're used to looking at. The tangential view, again, something I haven't looked at it a lot, but as Jack pointed out, it's really hot red right in the center, giving us a good sense that this is, you know, very steep in the center where the steepest part of the cornea is. What I thought was really fascinating is the elevation map. So take a look at this elevation map, it's the upper right map, and you see this little area that's red that's plus, and then you see a whole ring around it that's blue. Um, Jim, what is the blue area? What does that correspond to? Looks like a lot of spherical aberration to me. Right, but what was there before there was blue? Was it before the patient had LASIK? Before well, the patient had LASIK, you had normal cornea there and you ablated that ring right there. Right, you're seeing the ablation zone of a hyperopic LASIK. I mean, you can actually visualize the pattern of the laser that was used to steepen the cornea. In, the, in hyperopic LASIK, we're making a ring pattern. We're, we're doing this mid-peripheral ablation, removing tissue, and then you leave the central tissue. And I think it shows it really beautifully what happened. I just love this map. I think it's the first time to visualize it. And I, I did notice that on, on, on um, George's uh, map also. I didn't want to point out then because then I would lose the power of this presentation. But, <laughs> but, uh, but George's map also, hyperopic LASIK, show the same thing. It's the central, in this elevation map, it's going to show you this, the area where the ablation pro was performed. So I thought it was really helpful. And then you can also look at the elevation of the back map. If this is keratoconus, this would be abnormal. We'd expect to see a lot of hot spots, um, and I'm going to compare the two coming up. So and it's I, really good to see that, Bill, because you see that the hyperopic optical zone isn't all that big, right. really. I mean, that's one of the problems that comes about sometimes. Absolutely. And this is a very high, um, I, I, I'll just show you, that it was, go ahead. I've got a question for Jack real quick. Um, Jack, you pointed out, a, uh, I think, a post-refractive patient in your talk, and you saw, and, um, uh, showed some posterior elevation, and here, Bill, you're showing a post-refractive patient with with and with no uh, posterior elevation, which is reassuring. 
But we, we also uh, notice some artifact often with posterior elevation and, and post-refractive surgery. Um, so Jack, the question is, do you, you know, how, do we, how do we interpret or not over-interpret posterior elevation artifact in post-refractive corneas uh, in these cases? Well, you notice it's still green. And the point is there that what, what this shows you exactly was what Jim and Bill are pointing out that you've taken a cornea that was originally prolate and you've made a trough where that blue zone is in the upper right hand corner to pair that cornea into having a trough that makes that central area of about three or four millimeters steeper so that you correct that hyperopic refraction. Now, the point is that that three, five is all down in the green and yellow, so it had no effect on the back surface of the cornea, which it shouldn't when you treat that on the front. Now, the only other thing that I would point out to you, though, is that although the thinnest point is almost dead center on that elevation map, not the thinnest, but the highest elevation, if you look over at the axial maps, what you see is it's concentric with the pupil, but it's not concentric with the visual axis. In other words, we treat most of the time our LASIX on the pupil center. And that's not on the visual axis in a number of studies that Dan Reinstein and other people have shown that when you treat on the pupil, you're actually eccentric relative to the visual axis and you end up with coma. And so you can see that that's why that looks like in that right eye it's temporally dislocated because basically it was uh, centered on the pupil and not centered on the visual axis, which is what we do when we have a tracker. And so that alone causes some visual uh, performance questions. And it also is the reason why you have a limit of about three or four diopters with hyperopic because of that optical consequence. Absolutely, and you can see, I'm sorry, I didn't highlight it. I usually do try to always put a circle, a red circle, but it, there's a, a little reading where it says, the, I guess it, it predicted that this is about a 5.5 diopter hyperopic ablation. Um, so I thought that was interesting. So I'm gonna just compare it to keratoconus. Um, I thought this, this was interesting. So I took a patient, this is not exactly the same, but again, a patient with keratoconus, let's look at the maps comparing um, the hyperopic LASIK to, the, to a keratoconus patient. So first you see the axial map, um, and then if you look at um, this map here, sorry, go this way, which is the elevation front, kind of what we showed before, um, you can see the difference there where, you, again, you can see where this ablation zone was versus in keratoconus, you see the steeper area, but you don't get that nice circular ring. Um, you can also look at the back elevation, which is normal in the hyperopic LASIK, but quite abnormal in a patient with keratoconus. Um, and then also the pachymetry, uh, relative pachymetry map, which I also really like. Um, and you can see there that it's, uh, the blue here, just to point out, is I tried to show the scale, which is plus six um, centrally versus it's minus uh, six in the uh, patient's, patient with keratoconus. So it's going to get us, you have to get used to looking at the color map for the relative pachymetry. We know what to do with axial, what red is steeper, but again, pointing out that uh, the difference in the relative pachymetry between hyperopic LASIK and between keratoconus. So I love the map. Thank you, and uh, thank you. Okay, bye bye. Cases. Okay, Jim, let's see what your second case is here, and uh, there we go. All right, so we've been showing a lot of very abnormal eyes here. What I wanted to do is just show a really normal map, because if we don't understand normal, it's hard for us to integrate this into our private practices on a daily basis. So this is a patient that I think has an ideal map for multiple different lens implants and multiple different options here. When we look at our axial sagittal map here, we see nice regular astigmatism against the rule, and you can see the bars between each optical zone still aligning up all the way out toward, uh, they start breaking down a little past the five millimeter line uh, nasally, but temporally they go, they're pretty regular all the way out to seven millimeters. The tangential map the same way. We have nice regular against the rule astigmatism here. Uh, our posterior float is normal. There's a little bit of a blip of elevation, but this is what Jack and I were talking about. This patient is uh, born in 1960, so uh, not extremely old, but 
th this is not a keratoconus when we look at the Baleen Ambrosio and all the other programs available. So let's go take a look at all the K readings and everything. So we have two diopters of sill against the rule. Our spherical aberration is plus 0385. So this is gonna be a perfect patient for any of the multifocal toric lenses out there on the market today because they're aspheric, all right? So Alcon's somewhere around plus 016 to plus 018, depending on what lens and which paper you read. The J&J &J lens is minus 027, so great case for a toric lens implant here. RMS is nice 0 0.557, so low enough to use a multifocal product here. We look at our cord mu of 0 0.27, totally normal. And this is really important with multifocal torics because you have two axes you have to align with a multifocal toric. You have to get the multifocal lens to line up with the center of the pupil. And the way I do that, Jack, is with corneal reflex in surgery, using a Veritronics intraoperative keratometer, getting a red reflex on the cornea and centering that multifocal lens on the red reflex on the cornea, or you can have them fixate between the triangulation of the lights on a Zeiss microscope. Another technique to center the multifocal lens that works very well. But at the same time you're having to center it, you're also having to get that axis proper. And every now and then to get that lens centered, you may even have to move the lens slightly off your marks. And one of the lasers I use now that I do have, uh, I'm a consultant for, but it makes notches in the anterior capsule so we can see it really easy, know exactly where to center the lens as far as the axis goes, but then we have to center the optic of the multifocal lens as well. So this is just a great candidate that was a super good multifocal toric IOL for any of the different companies out there. This is just pretty much the ideal eye. No, 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 and, and let's clarify that just a little bit, Jim, because you raise an excellent point. What, what Jim is, is saying is this. When you center on the corneal reflex and put, say, the center of a diffractive multifocal lens, the visual axis is where that light reflex is when the patient is fixating on a coaxial light source. Now, you got to be careful because if you ask them to look at the bright light in that scope that's got an illumination and then two eyepieces, they're looking at the one at the far end. They're not looking at the center of the scope. So he's saying look in the center of the triangle or even better, you should have something on your microscope that gives you a corneal reflex that the patient can look at that's coaxial and then that light reflex is right on the visual axis and you want the center of the bullseye of that diffractive lens just about dead center on that visual axis. Now it's okay to be a little bit off towards the center of the pupil, which will be just a little bit temporal, but if you're on that bullseye, now here's the problem. When you do that, the marks that you have on the capsule and the marks that you would have on your limbus that give you the orientation, well, when you push that over to the center of the cornea, you're not even close to the visual axis, so you cannot get the line on the lens to go through the two marks you put on the cornea or the capsule. The best you can do is make it parallel to that line. All right, so let's say you have a mark at two o'clock and you have a mark at eight o'clock on the capsule or on the limbus. And that's the line that you wanna be parallel to. So when you nudge that lens over nasally, the center of the bullseye of that lens is on the visual axis. When you look at the two marks on the lens in that line, you're going to be parallel to the line that you formed on the capsule or on the limbus. You cannot put the line of the lens on those marks and have it in the right position. So always have the axis of the lens parallel to your reference marks. Now, if you have a microscope that's got that in there, again, you'll be parallel to that axis, but you can't get it, you can't do both. So that's why you wanna be parallel. 
These are such interesting points, and and this stuff is really hard to actually prove research-wise. We've we've tried a number of times, but we we, we wrote this paper um, that I just cited earlier. Uh, it's in the American Journal of Ophthalmology with uh, 2015 with with Daniel Chang. It was it's it's entitled the subject fixated. Uh, coaxially cited corneal light reflex as a new clinically relevant marker for centration. Um, and we actually did a meta-analysis of decades of all the different describing um, the different optical axes and, their, and, and why they actually don't really exist. It's m basically math uh, and it's not necessarily clinically relevant. And that's where what Jack just taught you and what Jim just taught you in practice is so important. And, the, and I'll just add one more pearl intraoperatively, the way that we bring this and make it clinically relevant is we take, if you break down the components of this new terminology, which is a mouthful, and we did that intentionally so you could make it useful, you actually take a zero degree coaxial microscope like a Zeiss Lumera, it has a zero degree offset, it's coaxial, meaning if you look down each optic optical pathway, there's zero offset. So it's the closest thing to real time ray tracing that you can do as long as the subject or the patient is participating and looking at the correct uh, target at infinity, all right? So the way to not get them confused, like Jack just taught you perfectly, is you just turn off the illumination light. Now you've gone from three reflexes to, and you've eliminated one, and now you've got two stereocoaxial objects to look at. You're connecting their, their fovea, essentially, to infinity, and you close one eye, tell them exactly which eye to look at that have, you have open, and then you nudge the central optic and center on it, and obviously you make sure that your, the, your torque is aligned just like Jack taught you as well. So that's just a, it's a real-time, clinically relevant approach to, to centration. Great. So, so George, I just had a question. So I definitely love your talk, and you've spoken about this before. How much shifting occurs in the capsular bag in the first couple of weeks? And I mean, obviously, if we start in a good spot, it's more likely we're going to end up in a good spot. But I'm just curious of what data we have looking at like the one-month outcomes, because I think that's the, the challenge. I'm just yeah. curious. Yeah, you know, we've actually tried to look at this um, over years and are not able to show a, a clinically relevant measure uh, that it matters yet. And in fact, Steve Shellhorn did a, a large meta-analysis of, of no centration technique whatsoever and showed that it didn't matter also. But we, Jack and I, worked for years on other optical devices um, like small aperture optics where, where there's zero question that it matters. I mean, it, centration, in fact, we've seen cases where, you know, you have decentered uh, small aperture optic uh, and um, you have very bad vision. You go recenter it and off the table, you can improve the vision six lines, distance and near immediately from recentration. So there's no, that's how I started thinking about this with, with multifocals. Jack, what are your thoughts? Well, I'll tell you what, there, uh, the studies, there's two of them actually. Uh, one of them is a Czechoslovakian paper that's in Czech, so it's kind of hard to read. Uh, <laughs> But there's uh, a second paper by Amir Argawal that is exactly on that. And what they did is they measured uh, what they called angle kappa, which was cord mu. And what they found was that patients who have a decentration of more than six tenths from the visual axis ended up with glare and halo. Both of those studies found that. They both had between 75 and 100 patients. And so what we did is we chose that value of six tenths uh, based upon what the topographic evidence for those uh, separations were for the, and both of them measured, uh, you had to kind of go back and calculate because they didn't know about cord mu back there, and they actually measured that relative to the center of the pupil and the center of the lens, okay, which is uh, what we're calling cord mu. And so what happens is if you, you find that the average decentration of a lens from the visual axis, when you put it in the bag and try to center it over a little bit, is about two to three tenths of a millimeter. And there's several studies on that. We actually went through that uh, with aspheric lenses when we first developed the technus almost 15 years ago. So two tenths is the average decentration from the visual axis. 
Now, what happens is Argawal study and that check study showed that if it gets up to six tenths, the problem is the diffractive optics aren't balanced and the pupil and the visual axis don't work. So what happens is two to three tenths of a millimeter is forgiving. In other words, you won't see a clinical difference in people uh, in their visual performance if a lens is within plus or minus two tenths of a millimeter from the visual axis, it won't matter. It won't make any difference. But if it gets up to four or five tenths, then it starts to degrade that optical image. Now on toric lenses, the rank is diffractive optics are what we're talking about, all right? The next thing is toric. If you have a toric lens off, it does affect the optics, but it's much more forgiving than a diffractive optic, so it's much greater than 0.6. The next is aspheric IOLs. Aspheric IOLs are actually more forgiving than the one above. And then spherical IOLs are the most forgiving, so you can almost be up to eight or nine tenths of a millimeter decentered. So I always talk about the diffractive optics because that's the one, if you're inside six tenths of a millimeter, you'll be okay, and everything else is bigger than that. Jack, talk about superior versus inferior versus nasal versus temporal. You know, there's, there's some talks of, you've given in the past about where's the yeah, worst spot yeah. for the lens. Well, uh, what happens is, is this. That light reflex tells you where you want to be. What is called vertex normal is within 50 microns of the visual axis in a normal patient, okay? Now, uh, if it's got an abnormal cornea, but you're almost exactly on the visual axis. Now, what happens is in the normal individual, that light reflex can be plus or minus 100 microns above or below. In other words, some people are superior, some people are inferior. So the light reflex is your bullseye. That's it. That vertex normal sight, coaxially sighted reflex is the bullseye. So wherever that is, if it's a little superior, inferior, nasal, it'll almost always be nasal. That's your bullseye. That's what you want to do. Now, if you take a lens and put the haptics horizontal and you push that lens over there, a self-centering lens tomorrow will be right back in the center of the bag. So that isn't gonna do you any good. So what we teach people for a single piece foldable lens, acrylic, that the haptics, if you put those in superiorly and you nudge that superior haptic over, the bottom haptic doesn't move. It's trapped in the bag by the friction. And what happens is the lens moves a little nasal and it moves a little inferior and that little manipulation can get the center of the optic very near that coaxial light reflex. But, but you can't do that with a torque multifocal. That's where the problem comes that's, in. Well, no, 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 you can. But what happens is when you do that, now your axis has changed. That's it. So what happens is now what you have to do is that manipulation has to be done where you get those lines parallel to the axis that you want because they can never be, in other words, the optic is still gonna move where you have an axis on that optic. And now what happens is after you've done that little manipulation above, you've rotated the lens clockwise. So now to keep it over nasal, you gotta get the lower haptic and pull it back and ultimately, I'm not saying that's easy because you have to get it parallel to the axis you want and you try to get the optic centered on the visual axis. And those two manipulations is why you're such a great surgeon. <laughs> okay, other questions now from the audience. Yes, sir. If the pupil is 0.6 millimeters nasal. Yes. How do you, how do you weigh the, the value or weight of having the optic centered very, versus being decentered well, Well, and, the and that's, that's a good point. What we've actually talked about this morning is placing the optic on the visual axis, which is on the light reflex. Now, it turns out for a diffractive multifocal lens, you actually also want the rings concentric with the pupil to get a balanced diffraction pattern. All right, so one's on the center of the pupil and the one's on the light reflex and the average distance is three tenths of a millimeter. So the optimal location depends on the patient's eye and it's about halfway between those two. So if it was six tenths of a millimeter, you'd end up with the lens being halfway between the pupil center and the light reflex, which would be three tenths of a millimeter. But what we've just said is when it's six tenths of a millimeter, 
that is cord mu and six tenths, that's not good because it's so large that halfway between is three tenths from the middle of the pupil and three tenths from the visual axis and the patients are gonna complain of glare and halo. So in that case, that's probably not a good case for a multifocal lens because that's the upper limit. When it's four tenths, you're never more than two tenths away, it's okay. All right, well, unfortunately, we have a Journal of Cataract Refractive Surgery. I really appreciate you all coming this morning. Let's have a big hand for our panel because they were so good this morning. And thank you.